Okay, so let's start. In the last class, we were looking at uh, linear codes, in particular properties of linear codes and uh, minimum distance of linear codes. We saw a connection between the minimum distance and the number of linearly independent columns of the parity check matrix. Right. So, in particular, we we saw that if you have any n k linear code with some parity check matrix H and then the minimum distance is basically equal to 1 plus the, the minimum, the maximum number of columns which are all linearly independent. So, you look at that collection of columns, the minimum collection of columns such that every L columns of H are linearly independent. Right and this and this basically gives you uh, one whatever the, the minimum distance minus one. So given any linear code, if I specify the parity check matrix, you have an algorithm to find the minimum distance of this code without explicitly listing all the code books. Correct? Right? And, and we saw a little example of, of how to do that for a toy example. Right? So now and and later on we saw two different techniques of decoding linear codes. So uh, one is standard array decoding. Basically, you list all possible code words, find the minimum, find the distance to each code word, and then minimize that minimize that particular quantity. Right? That that's what we call array decoding. Uh, but then we saw that there's a slightly better way of doing it using syndromes. Essentially, uh, this is the right picture to look at. Instead of listing all possible code words, in some sense, you are listing error vectors. Right or syndromes. So, uh, what are potential minimum weight error vectors that you can correct? So, you list all of them, and given the received vector, you first compute the syndrome. So, the syndrome, in some sense, gives you the color of the coset, or 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 in other words, the coset to which the received vector belongs to. Find the minimum weight error vector co corresponding to that particular coset, and you subtract that out. So, that gives you uh, one way of decoding. As long as uh, the, the error vector has weight less than half the minimum distance of the code, you are guaranteed to be correct. But beyond that, anyway, the, there are no guarantees that you can give. You might be wrong. Okay. So, any questions? Okay, so now that we've had, now that we have some understanding of linear codes uh, and codes in general, uh, we want to know what is the largest size of, of the code, right? The size of the largest code that we can possibly construct for certain specified parameters. So if I give you Maybe if, if I give you n comma d, so I specify the block length and I give you the minimum distance that I want to target. So, so maybe I know that my channel can make at most uh, np number of errors. So I want the minimum distance to be how much? So if I want to correct NP number of errors, what should my minimum distance be? Yeah. So, so 2 NP plus 1 it should be larger than 2 times NP. So, so, so given P, I can compute the minimum distance that I want to target. So for this, what is the maximum rate that I can achieve? Right? What is the largest? What is the largest k? K for which there exists an n k t linear code 
or maybe I'm not even interested in, in linear codes. I could be just be interested in n, right? so nkd linear codes or n2 to the k d codes in general. So this is what I'm interested in. Uh, uh, the alphabet size is specified to me. Maybe it's over some finite field Q. And uh, I'm given N and I'm given D. So the goal is to find out what is the largest K for which it is possible to construct a linear code. I'm not worried about how to decode this code. I'm, I'm Right now I'm not even worried about how to construct this code. It's okay, even if you don't specify the code exactly, but I want to know what is the best that I can achieve. So basically we want bounds on the size of codes for a given n and for a given minimum distance. And note that I'm interested in every n. So uh, unlike uh, our, the course in channel coding, where we essentially looked at very large n, right now I'm, I'm interested in finite n. So for every n and every d, I want the best k. I may or may not be able to solve this exactly. Correct? Uh, in, in channel coding, that is in other words, when I had, when I want to know, know what is the maximum rate of transmission over a binary symmetric channel, I know that asymptotically it is 1 minus the binary entropy of P, correct. Uh, we have seen that there exist codes which operate at a rate close to 1 minus H2 of P uh, and achieve vanishingly small probability of error. At the same time, we know that you can't target any rate above 1 minus h of p asymptotically. So, so in other words, at least for asymptotic n, that problem is, is, is completely solved. We know what is the best rate of transfer. Now, for finite n, of course, it's a much more complicated situation. Uh, for a given probability of error, we don't know what the best uh, rate that we can achieve is. We have some bounds, some good bounds for finite block length case. But particularly for small block lengths, let's say n equal to 100. I give you n equal to 100 and I, I, the, the, the channel is the binary symmetric channel with crossover probability maybe 0.1. I want the probability of error to be at most say 10 to the minus 3. What is the best rate that I can achieve? Now, there are good, decent bounds, but, but we don't know what the exact, what the best bound is. But at least for asymptotically large in that problem is solved. Now, on the other hand, our channel now is a bit different. Right? We are saying that the channel is this adversarial bit flip channel. It can make at most NP bit flips, right? Not random, but can be arbitrary. Uh, what is the best rate of transmission? It turns out that in this case, even for asymptotically large n, we don't know what the answer is. It's an unsolved problem. And in fact, the best bounds that we have today date back to like several decades ago. There has been no progress on this ever since. In, in certain regimes, we know something slightly better. For example, when the field size is extremely large, for certain field sizes and so on. But let's say just the binary field. The binary input, binary output, bit flips, NP, we don't know what the answer is. So now we'll, we'll explore some of the bounds that are known uh, and, we, and we'll also see some codes that for, for certain regimes uh, we'll, we'll see some codes which, which achieve these bounds. Okay? But, and we'll see what happens when, n, when we take n to be very large, n to be small and so on. So first, uh, let's, let's first look at the, the linear code scale. Uh, in the last class, we saw that uh, the minimum distance so for any linear code C what was D equal to in terms of the parity check matrix? So the minimum distance is D yeah, L minus 1, right? Uh, L minus 1, L plus 1, right? So a, every D minus 1 columns are linearly independent. Where 
let me put it this way for linear codes every t minus 1 columns of any parity check matrix for the code are linearly independent Right. Now, does this give a bound on D? I specify N, I specify K. Okay, for a given N comma K, can you give a bound on D using this? How large can D be? Uh, when, why do you say that? Uh -huh. Correct. So the number of rows is n minus k. Very good. Okay. Correct. Not more than n minus k columns can be linearly independent. So therefore, uh, more than n minus k columns can be linearly independent. So this implies that d minus 1 should be less than or equal to n minus k or d should be less than or equal to n minus k plus. So this holds for any linear code over any field. Okay, but this works for linear codes alone. Now I want to prove a similar bound, exactly the same bound for arbitrary codes. Okay, I want to show that for any code, code uh, D is less than or equal to n minus well k or in other words t log log to the base q m plus one q is the field size and uh, m is the number of code words so d is always less than or equal to n minus log m plus 1. So to see why this is the case, let us take L to be C of log m to base q plus 1 plus 1. Okay. Now what can I say about q to the power of l? This is strictly, sorry. So if I take q to the power of l, is this going to be less than or equal to m or greater than or equal to m? greater than or equal to it. Right? Okay. So, so now, suppose that I do the following. I look at the first L coordinates. Okay. Uh, and I list, so, so basically I take a list of all possible code words. Okay. Uh, 
I list all possible code words and I look at all of them in the first L coordinate. I claim that at least two code words will match in the first L coordinate. So I list all possible code words okay, and I look at the first L coordinates of all the code words. And, and out of those, I want to know if there is a match between, I claim that there are at least two code words for which they match exactly in the first L coordinates. There exist two code words. C1, maybe CI and CJ such that the first L coordinates are the same. Uh, I m minus is less than or equal to right? So I list all possible code words. There are m code words. Okay. Uh, I delete all the last l, n minus l coordinate. Keep only the first l coordinate. There are m code words. Right. I see the first l coordinates of all the code words. How many distinct vectors can there be? The alphabet size is q. So what is the maximum number of distinct vectors you can find you can form for alphabet size q of length l so that's what i'm trying to show so suppose you get the first statement i list all possible code words I look at the first L coordinates. I keep the first L coordinates and I throw the remaining code, the remaining entries away. Okay, I just look at for each code word, the first coordinate, second coordinate up to the Lth coordinate. Okay, and I and I ignore the rest. Maybe I just erase all of them out. Okay, and I list all of them. Now out of these, what is the maximum number of distinct vectors I can form out of L? Ah, so field size is q, right? I'm keeping only l coordinates. No, I'm looking at the first l coordinates only. So how many query vectors are there of of length l? L, yes. Q to the power of L. That is the maximum number of distinct vectors that I can see in, in vectors of among vectors of length L. But how many code words do I have? No, how many vectors do I have? I have M of them, right? Correct. 
have m vectors where m is strictly larger than q to the power of l right so and i'm looking at only the first l coordinates so there must be a match at least among two you agree you don't agree okay okay let's take a simple example okay uh let us take l equal to 2 q equal to 2 okay and i'll take let us say five code words m equal to 5 okay and whatever n equal to it can be anything it can be four give me any four code any five code words of length 4 give me any five code. 0 1 1 0 1 0 1 0 0 0 1 1 1 1 1 I need 5 code words 1 0 1 so I have 5 distinct code words now out of these I am going to look at only the first L coordinate so L equal to 2 ok and I ignore the rest. My question is, are there going to be any two vectors which match? Exactly. 1, 0 and 1, 0 match. And why does this happen? It is because of, uh, among all length L code words, I can form at most Q to the power of L distinct sequences. Correct? But then I have more than Q to the power of L sequences in total. So at least two of them must match exactly. Just it's called the pigeonhole principle. You have pigeons and you have holes. If there are more pigeons than holes, at least two pigeons must go into the same. That's 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 all there is. So there must be at least two code words where the first L coordinates are exactly the same. Now, what does this tell us about the minimum distance? So the first L coordinates of at least two code words are exactly the same. Right, so they can own if they if these if you just look at these two code words, they can differ in how many coordinates max n minus l, right? No more than n minus l. So what this implies is that the minimum distance can be no larger than n minus l. Because there are two code words for which the first L coordinates are exactly the same. But what is L equal to? Steel log m to base q minus 1 n minus log m plus 1. Or this is the same as n minus k plus 1. So now this holds for any code, not just linear codes. Any questions? So, so this bound n minus k plus 1 is what is called the singleton bound. And any code which achieves the singleton bound, so this holds for every code. If there is a code which, which achieves the singleton bound, that is, d is equal to n minus k plus 1, then it is called a maximum dis distance separable code. The code c is said to be maximum distance separable if the minimum distance is equal to n minus k plus 1, which is n minus. Okay. Is it possible to construct maximum distance separable? So here's an example of 
an MDS code. So let us look at a large field size, F7. Okay, uh, here is one example. So let us take the parity check matrix. Okay, so what are N and K in this case? I, what is K? K is 2. Uh, so what is N minus K plus 1? Yeah, 4. Okay. So what do I want to show? If if this this is MDS, then how many columns should be linearly independent? Four. T is four. T minus one columns, so three. So if if every set of three columns are linearly independent, then this is MDS. Correct. Uh, now are is every pair of columns linearly independent? You have to be careful because this is over F7. But in fact, it is, you can show that this is the, the linear leap. Take the difference between every two rows, every two columns, this they will be linearly independent. Or is every three by three submatrix linearly independent? So let's just as an example, let us take the first three columns. One, 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 three, one, four, two. So how will you check whether these are linearly independent or not? Uh, okay, but really you should not be calculating determinants. When you want to verify the yeah, you wrote it. Okay, so what would you get? Two. Six, six, one minus six is minus three. Mod seven is what? Remember, this is you modulo seven arithmetic. Yeah. So, what is the rank? You can do this for every possible submatrix. And you can you can verify that is indeed every three by three matrix is. But in fact, you can prove that this is full rank. I mean, I, this, the way I've written it, it doesn't really give any intuition as to how I constructed this matrix, or or why it is why it should be full rank. So this is a specific example of of a class of linear codes called generalized Reed Solomon codes. So we basically look at FQ for a really large field size Q. So Q in particular has to be larger than N. Q 
you take alpha 2 n distinct elements of this field and you construct the parity check matrix 1 alpha 1 square to alpha 1 power n minus k minus 1 1 alpha 2 2 square to alpha 2 power n minus k minus 1 1 n square n minus k I take any arbitrary finite field with this and, and a parity check matrix with this particular structure it turns out that this will have minimum distance t equal to n minus k plus 1 We will explore Reed Solomon codes in some detail later on, but, but one reason why this, this holds is, uh, is, is basically you can prove that the minimum distance is n minus k plus 1 using the technique which well you mentioned, using the determinant. So if you take any n minus k by n minus k uh, sub matrix, basically you take any n minus k columns. What structure will it have? So this will have the structure 1, whatever, alpha 1, maybe it's not the same, alpha, right, beta 1, beta 1 square up to beta 1 power n minus k minus 1, 1, beta 2, beta 2 square, beta 2 to the power of n minus k minus 1 and so on beta n minus k n minus k raised to n minus k so this is a very structured matrix have you seen such a matrix before what is it where have you seen it before okay which course okay what is the what is such a matrix? Yeah? No, 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 there are no. Are you, are you talking about the Fourier matrix? No, no. Correct. No, but, but these are elements from a finite field, remember. Correct. So this is what is called a van der Mond matrix. Okay, and the determinant turns out to be just the product of differences between every pair of elements. Uh, and if, if all the elements are distinct, then this automatically has full. So, have you seen one Van der Mond matrices? Have you heard the word Van der Mond before? You can construct a Van der Mond matrix over any finite field, or any field for that matter. So, this is a nice linear algebraic technique of constructing a linear code, and this achieves the singleton bound. Right? So it's a, it's a maximum distance separable code. Uh, the, basically, it will be equal to this. Determinant is the product overall i equal to 1 up to, to what is n k minus n minus k elements. So n minus k product k equal to i plus 1 k of beta i minus beta j minus b.
So all of these differences are non-zero because beta i is never equal to beta j for any i not equal to j. So this determinant is always non-zero. Any questions? So we'll explore uh, generalized reed solomon codes later on, how do we decode and so on. So encoding is efficient, this matrix multiplication, this has good minimum distance. And it turns out that you can also decode reed solomon codes very efficient. Just roughly order quadratic time decoding. So that's a very powerful code and that is why this is used a lot in practice. In, in storage kind of applications. And some of the early communication systems also used read solomon codes and stuff. So, so these are very good against worst case errors. Okay, so that's one bound. Okay. Uh, but in a certain regime, it is optimal. But in many regimes, it is not. We can construct much better bounds than the singleton bound. So now let's do. Let's try to use sort of a so, so this was sort of a linear algebraic argument for linear codes, of course, but for arbitrary codes, it's basically a counting argument. So all of these bounds, as we will see, uh, some of the simple bounds are all basically counting arguments, pigeonhole principle or so something of that sort. Uh, so let's look at a slightly different approach. Okay, so. So let us look at the space of all vectors, which is fq to the n. Right? Now our goal is to ensure that the minimum distance is at least d. Right? So what does that mean if I take any particular code word? I have a bunch of code words. Right? Uh, if I draw a ball of radius d minus 1 by 2, right? What should happen? No two balls should intersect. Correct? I look at any d minus 1 by 2 balls. So basically, Hamming balls of radius d minus 1 by 2. So all those vectors which are within a radius, within distance d minus 1 by 2 around a particular code word. So these balls should not intersect. Otherwise, the minimum distance is, is not D. Right? The minimum distance is equal to D. Hamming balls radius d minus one two centered at code words cannot intersect. So this is basically a problem of sphere packing. How many balls can you pack in the space such that no two balls intersect? And for this, we can give a simple geometric kind of argument. What is the total number of points that we have in space? Q to the power of n. So Q to the power of n. And what can we say about the volume of each? So let's let's say that VQ, let's define VQ of n comma R to be the number of points which lie within distance R to any given point. Basically the volume of the having ball. So this is the volume of one particular ball. If m is the total number of balls, m times pq of n comma r 
is the total volume occupied by all the balls put together. Right? And we know that no two balls can intersect. So what can you say about the, this quantity and this quantity? Is, can you say one of them is larger than the other? Which, which side should the, should the inequality go? Which one? It should be less than or equal to. This is the total volume of all the balls put together. The balls cannot intersect. Right? So the sum of the volumes of all the balls can be no larger than the total volume that is available to me. Right? So think about this as though you have a tank full of water and you are trying to isolate them into little regions called balls and no two regions can intersect with each other. So the total volume that you have uh, is has to be at least the sum of the volumes of the individual balls. So where r is equal to d minus 1 by 2. So, okay, so now this gives a specific bound. So, this is what we call the sphere packing bound or the Hamming bound. Correct. So, so what is the total number of points in FQ to the power of n? Q power n. This is the total number of points that is available to us. This is the total number of points uh, which cannot be code words around a given point, uh, around a given code word, right? Take any code word over here. I look at all those points. It's impossible for any of these to be code words, right? So basically I have to remove this chunk out. How many points are there? That is VQ of N comma R. This is around one particular code word. There are M code words in total. So the sum of the volumes or the some of the number of points in all of these balls put together is m times vq of n comma. Now with this, I may or may not exhaust all of fq to the power of n. There may be little gaps in between. So it could be less than or equal to q to the power of n. So, so this is a bound. It's a so m should be less than or equal to q to the power of n divided by p q of n comma. So this is the Hamming bound. Now what is v q of n comma r equal to? Huh? So for any given point, I want to count the number of points around it which are within Hamming distance of r. So take f cube to the power of n, take any point, let's say the zero vector, right? I want to find how many vectors in f cube to the power of n there are, which are within Hamming distance of r to this given point. So take, take one particular example. So, so let's first define this particular quantity. So this is the number of points in FQ to the power of n, which within Hamming distance R to any vector in particular I can just take 0 to the power. So yeah, so this is the center. So the center is let's say 0 to the power of n. It doesn't matter right what the center is. 
So if you take say Euclidean space and you take a ball, the volume of the ball does not depend on where the center is. Do you agree? The same holds in this case as well. Okay. What, what, what does n? n is fixed, right? n is the dimension of the core. Yeah, whatever. The block length. So this quantity is independent of capital M. Point. The, the points change, but the number of points will still remain the same. So I'm not talking about the number of code words, I'm talking about all points in FQ to the power of. There's no code here, right? So for this quantity VQ of n comma r, it's not the number of code words which are within Hamming distance. It is the number of total number of points in FQ to the power of n. Okay, so so so, so let's do it step by step. Okay, uh, maybe let's just take one particular example, zero zero. So take this as the center. Zero 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 is my center. Uh, can you at least give me some points? which are, okay, so let's list all vectors which are within Hamming distance 1 to this particular sequence. 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. any more? So what is the total number of points which are within Hamming distance of 1, within Hamming distance of 4, 4, sorry, within Hamming distance 1 to this particular thing, are you sure it's 4, there are 5, you have to also include this, so this is Hamming distance 0. So I take, give me any other point, let's take 0, 1, 0, 0, or maybe 0, 1, 0, 1, okay. Can you tell me all the code word, all the vectors which are within Hamming distance 1 to this? 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. Any more? So, what is one way of getting this set from this set? So, this is the set of all points which are within Hamming distance 1 to 0, 1, 0. This is the set of all points which are within Hamming distance 1 to 0, 0, 0, 0. So you add 0, 1, 0, 1 to each of these vectors, you get this particular. So if, if I call BQ n comma r, B Hamming distance, sorry, Hamming ball, Radius R round in Q of X R round the vector X, then this is the same as. 
पी एन क्यू ऑफ एक्स को और इज बेसिकली नथिंग एक्स प्लस एन क्यू जीरो look at the humming ball of radius r around the zero vector you add the vector x to every single vector in the set you will get the humming ball of radius r around x so therefore no matter where the center is the volume always remains the same correct okay so now what what exactly is it equal to what is the volume equal to? So look at all possible Hamming distances less than or equal to r, correct? So Hamming distance zero up to Hamming distance r, correct? So what is the number of points which are exactly at Hamming distance p to say the zero, to the zero vector? Uh, okay, in CT, that's only part of the answer. So n choose t. Basically, you pick t coordinates. You put q power t, then you're double counting. Exactly at coming distance. So, so you pick t locations okay now in those t locations it has to be different from your given vector let's take the zero vector 0 0 0 0 let's pick two locations say this location and this location okay that's so there are whatever n choose t different ways of picking those locations i mean what values can you replace it with in these locations Uh, if I put 0, then what will the, so, so let's say I put 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So here I put a 0, here I put a 1. What is the Hamming distance between this and this? It's not 2. It is 1. I want Hamming distance exactly equal to 2. Yeah? I have to replace both by 1. Or if it's a larger field, so how many possible values can you replace these with q minus 1 power t right so in each location you have q you can replace it with q minus 1 values so all of them all the values that you replace it with should be different from the value that is originally there right so i have q minus 1 raised to t possible values i can replace it with in those t locations so this is the total volume of thing. <laughs> okay. So let's try to just evaluate this for maybe one example. So remember that this is u. And the Hamming bound basically tells us that m it has to be less than or equal to q to the power of n divided by p q of n comma t e minus one. Okay, so now let's maybe take n equal to so q equal to two. I'm looking at binary codes. Uh, n equal to 7 okay. and uh, t equal to 3. So I want to know what is the largest k such that there exists an n 2 to the power k 
a code. Okay, or if there's a linear code, then nk3 code. So what is dq of n com d minus 1 2 in this case what is d minus 1 by 2 1 summation i equal to t equal to 0 to 1 n choose t n is t what is q? It is 2. Two. It is uh, 7 choose 0 plus 7 choose 1. 1 plus 7 equal to 8. Okay, so now what is m is less than or equal to? to the power 3, 2 to the power 7 divided by 3, 60. This is the largest code that we can find. This is the size of the largest code that we can have with uh, n equal to 7 and d equal to 3. Of course, now I'm giving all of these bonds, but it's not necessary that there exists a code with these bonds, which, which meet these bonds. Right? This is an upper bond. It's not an achievability. But in some cases, we can find codes which meet these bonds. Okay, in particular, if, if a code achieves the sphere packing bond or the Hamming bond, then it's called a perfect code. N M D code perfect if if it meets the Hamming bond. So in other words, it achieves the Hamming bond with equality. And here's an example of a perfect code. So it's called the 743 Hamming code. And this was, in fact, one of the first error correcting codes ever known in the literature. So this has parity check matrix equal to 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Basically take all the integers from 0, 1 up to 7, look at their binary representation and then list all of them as the columns of So this is called the 743 Hamming code. And so if, if for this to have minimum distance 3, how many columns should be linearly independent? Yeah. 3 minus 1. Every pair of columns should be linearly independent. Uh, does it happen here? Is every pair of columns linearly independent? Yeah, right. Every every pair of columns, every column is distinct. Right. So every pair is linearly independent. Now you can try to take a subset of this. Let's look at H equal to say 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1, 0. Okay. So this is a six 
four three equal right uh sorry not four what is k in this case six three three code so it's a six three three code uh and you can now try to compute the Hamming bound for this. What is the Hamming bound equal to? What is Q to the power of N divided by PQ of So this is 2 to the 6 divided by P2 of 6 comma P minus 1. The denominator is still 8. The numerator is 6. Yeah. 2 to the power 3. Does this meet the humming bound? It could words are possible, yeah, but does, does this particular code meet the humming bound? How, why do you say only six code words are possible? It's a six three three code, right? So k is three. So what is m equal to? Two power k, two power three, which is eight. Eight is a perfect. So I got this by deleting one of the coordinates. Any two. Two, two, two. So can you correct? So in this H, at most two columns. So every set of two columns is linearly independent. Right? Every, every yes, every set. Because I mean, maximum you know that n minus k columns there will be exist some n minus k columns which are linearly independent because the rank is uh, n minus k. Right? So the maximum number l such that every l columns are linearly independent. Now, if you take the Reed Solomon code, for example, take this code. So this was optimal in some sense because it because it achieved the singleton bound. Right? Now let's see if it achieves the sphere packing bound or not. Right? Uh, so in this case, what is D equal to? 4. So this this d is equal to four. Uh, on the other hand, n is five and k is equal to two. Right? So n equal to five, k equal to d equal to four. A equal to two. Right? So that is what we had from the from the singleton bound. So in this case, 
okay i can instead of taking d minus so, so since d is even fine so so now can you can you compute the hamming bound for this particular case remember that it is over f7 not over f2 so what will pq of n comma d minus in this case i can take d by 2 because i want to ensure that no two balls of radius d are intersecting I have to take d by 2 minus we strictly rescind one of n choose d which is i choose d q minus 1 to t yeah so and what is q to the power of 7 7 to the power of 5 divided by 31 Uh, but on the other hand, uh, what is what is the actual number of code words in this code? Forty nine, right? which is far lower than so. In fact, in this case, the singleton bound beats the Hamming bound. But you can try to compute the singleton bound in this particular case. So let's look at the Hamming code, right? What is uh so it's seven four three right so what is n minus k plus one equal to seven minus four four so the single term bound says the minimum distance should be less than or equal to four but in this case the hamming bound gives me something better because it says d should be less than or equal to three and this code achieves the hamming. So for f2, n equal to 7 and k equal to 4, the hamming bound is better than the singleton bound. But on the other hand, for field size 7, n equal to 5 and whatever k equal to 2, the singleton bound is better. So for a given n and k, it's possible that one bound is better than the other, but there's no uniform. There is no one single bound which uniformly beats the other bound for all n and k. Okay, so in certain regimes, for certain parameters, some bounds are better. Sorry? Yeah, tighter. So there is no one bound which is greater than or less than the other bound. So these two were approaches for deriving upper bounds on the size of linear space. We'll explore some more upper bounds, but now we also need to know what is achievable, right? Uh, can we get a lower bound on the size of a code for a given minimum distance? And for that, we'll we'll use sort of a geometric idea. What if we try to construct a code in a greedy fashion? Okay? And the basic idea is the following. So again, I have the entire space fq to the n. So suppose I just arbitrarily pick one particular code. Doesn't matter where I start. I pick one code word. 
Okay. Now, if I want to pick the next code word, what do I have to ensure? I have to ensure that the next code word I pick is not within having distance of D to this particular code. Correct. So, let us suppose that I eliminate all sequences within distance D minus 1 to this particular vector. So I take, I start with an arbitrary vector. That's my going to be my first code word. I put this in the code book. Next, I remove all the vectors which are within Hamming distance d minus 1 to this particular vector. Take the Hamming ball of radius d minus 1. So everything that remains has, minimum, has distance at least d to this particular vector. Agree. So out of these, I can pick any other code word. I can pick any vector as my code word. Let me do that. I just pick some vector. Maybe I pick this particular vector. Okay. Now what do I do? Now out of the remaining vectors, I will again throw away all vectors which are within distance p e minus one to this. Now, if I look at the vectors that remain after this step, after the second step, all the remaining vectors will have distance at least d to this vector and they will also have distance at least d to this particular vector right? because I have thrown away all the bad vectors. I keep repeating till I can't, till I have no more vectors left. The next, maybe I pick this particular vector, so I throw away some more code words, then maybe I pick this vector, I throw away all code words and I pick this vector, I will throw away some more. So I will keep going till I can't pick anymore. My entire FQ to the n is exhausted. That is a greedy way of construction. So let me just lay out all the steps. Start with with an arbitrary okay, let me call it x1 in fq to the n okay so so i'll define two sets one which i call r which is kind of the set of remaining vectors and then the other my code book okay. so maybe i'll call this code book at step i the remaining vectors at step this until set of remaining vectors is empty. I don't have any more vector. Okay, what do I do? I'll I'll put the current vector to first. Let me increment. Okay. So I pick one more. So I add this vector to the original code. So originally I start with empty set for the i. Sorry. So I'll call C0 to be the empty set and R0 to be FQ to the end. But step one, step one, I have one code word. I add x one to this, and then uh, I I remove. Uh, so so the originally my code book was empty. Now it has one code. R i is now i minus one 
So out of the Ri, out of the remaining vectors, I throw away all the vectors which were within having distance to x. Ming ball. U. Yes. T minus. Correct. Then what do I do? Just increment. Pick. I. increment that's that's an algorithm it's a greedy algorithm for constructing right any questions so the basic idea is just that at every step you throw away vectors which cannot form code words and then whatever out, out of whatever remains you pick one and add it to your code book. okay uh, Sorry, which one? Yes. Ah, okay. You know this. Okay. So now let's see. So at each step, how many code words are we removing? Or how many vectors are we, how many candidate vectors are we removing at each step? At most these many. These many. So that is PQ of n comma t minus one. So we're removing these many vectors in each step. Right? Uh, we could be removing fewer than these, right? Because if you see this, uh, you could have removed some of these and now you're kind of double counting. But that's fine. I want a lower bound. So let's say that I remove these many at I move, I remove at most these many vectors at each step. Right? And how many steps am I running this for? Capital M steps. Right? Because I have M code words in the book. The distance is I'm guaranteed that the ultimately I'm going to get a, a code book with minimum distance at least D. So what can I say about M? So M is at least how many, I have a total of Q to the N vectors to choose from and at each step I'm discarding P Q of N comma T minus 1, correct? Correct. So not distance, not radius distance. So basically what am I doing? So this is a different approach. So so that so what you're talking about is kind of the sphere packing argument, right? So right now I'm not doing that. So first step I'm going to remove all vectors of radius d minus one around the code word. Right? Out of the remaining, so I have a bunch of vectors left over. What can I say about the remaining vectors? All of them have distance at least d to, to the vectors that have been put in my code book already. Right? I pick one of them, any one of them. So, so that is why I'm I'm throwing away code words of or I mean vectors of radius d minus one to the previous code book. At every step. Minimum at least d. So this is this is what is called the Gilbert Washamow bound or the GV bound. Remember that we had a sphere packing bound which looked kind of similar, but but this quantity here was different. It was d minus one by two. So the sphere packing bound or the Hamming bound tells you that is q to the n divided by p q of n comma t minus one by 
huge factor factor of a difference with me. So our upper bounds and lower bounds are very very different in general. So for each of these, you can try to plot what what this looks like when uh, when n is very very large. Okay. So suppose I I want to communicate over a bit flip channel, uh, which can make roughly n p bit flips. Okay. So for a given p, I want to find out how the rate behaves for very large n, n tending to infinity. Okay. Now uh, let's take q equal to two, just for simplicity. Okay. So obviously p can be no larger than. Uh, let's look at the, the. Let's first look at the singleton bound. K equal to n minus d equal to n minus k plus one or k equal to n minus d plus one. Right. So, as what I want to know is how k by n behaves as n tends to n. So, this is 1 minus d1 divided by n. Uh, but if I want to tolerate np number of erasures, sorry, er errors, then how large should d be? n p plus 1 whatever 2 divided by n. So, as n tends to infinity, this quantity tends to 1 minus 2 p. So, how does that behave? For p equal to 0, r is equal to 1. Uh, and what is the, so what does this look like? What is the shape? Straight line. Uh, what is the x intercept? So it's basically the the singleton bound gives you a straight line from one to half. Now you can try to do the same for these two. Uh, the single the, the the sphere packing bound and the GV bound. So so what is p q of n comma two p n? How does this behave? Do you remember from your information theory coding course? The volume of a having ball, asymptotic volume of a having ball. This is actually an exercise in the information theory course. But you can show that this is roughly 2 to the n times the binary entropy of So the volume of a Hamming ball of radius whatever n p is two to the n times roughly two to the n times binary entropy. Okay, so uh, entropy. So, so on the right hand side, I get roughly two to the n times one minus h two p. On the left side, I will get 2 to the n times 1 minus hp. If I try to plot this, so this quantity, the sphere packing bound, turns out to be, look something like this. Because entropy H2 of P is, is maximized when P equal to half. 1 minus H of P is minimized. It, it becomes 0 when uh, P equal to half. But on the other hand, if I look at uh, H2P, 1 minus H2P, this becomes 0 for P equal to a quarter. So this is the GV bound. 
So even for asymptotically large n, this is sort of the best achievability that is known. The blue curve. Uh, so far, the best upper bound that we have is Hamming bound for asymptotically large n. So for asymptotically large n, the Hamming bound is better than the sphere pack the, than the singleton bound. Uh, and now there is this big gap between the GV bound and the sphere packing. So in fact, you can prove better bounds than the Hamming bound, but but it turns out that the best known bound is still something like best known upper bound, and there is a gap. Let's stop here. Hope to stop. Any questions? So closing this gap between the upper and lower bounds is a long-standing open. Sorry. Uh, there are tighter bounds only for the upper bound. So the best known lower bound, I mean in general, is the GV bound. Nothing better than that. In specific cases, yeah, we don't know. But there are claims, or at least people believe that, some people believe that GV bound is tight. Tight. At least in certain regimes, for certain Q, asymptotically. For finite n, yeah, sure, we can do things better. We can, you can beat the GV bound for finite n. Uh, but, but in general, for the binary case, asymptotically large n, Many people do believe that the GV bond is true.